Hey, it's Mrs. Hale coming at you to talk about President Truman and looking at the domestic affairs that he is involved in. So keep in mind, these six things are kind of the big overall ideas of what's going on in the 1940s to 1950s um, while Truman is president. So starting off by talking about the economy, a lot of economists thought that the economy would take a tank and go into a depression, similarly how we had been in one after World War II with the Great Depression. Um, but it actually turned out that we were going to go into an economic boom. Um, Americans had saved about $140 and a billion dollars, excuse me, $140 billion um, during World War II and the Great Depression. And so now after the war, they have this sense of wanting to spend their money. And so they ended up spending money on new ho homes, new cars, uh, new household appliances. Uh, the downside to this, though, is that consumers were frustrated when they couldn't get their hands on the goods because of supply and demand and demand exceeded the supply. But also when we started to see prices jump, um, particularly with the price of food, clothing and fuel. So with the economic boom, we then also have for Truman's domestic affairs, uh, the GI Bill. So the GI Bill was for veterans that had served active duty for 90 days or more and who had not been dishonorably discharged. What the GI Bill gave you was um, potential for a low interest cost mortgages, uh, low interest loans to buy a home, or it's not just a home, excuse me, but businesses or farms, one year of unemployment compensation, and actually assistance if you wanted to go back to school, whether it be high school, college, or vocational school. Um, once again, though, you had to be a war veteran that had seen, that had been on active duty, though. So also while Truman is president, we have the 22nd Amendment and the Presidential Secession Act. So the Presidential Secession Act finally put into actual law what we had been following all the time, that the vice president rolls up to president if something happens to said original president, um, whether that be removal, death, resignation, that type of idea. Now, the 22nd Amendment is what finalized that presidents could not serve more than two consecutive terms in office. Keep in mind that everyone had just followed that because of what George Washington had done, except for, of course, um, FDR. So it was finally made an amendment that presidents could only serve two consecutive terms and for no more than 10 years total. What the 10 years comes from is if you are a vice president and something happens and you become president, you can only serve two years of that final term so what I would basically mean is if you take current President Biden, if something were happened to him, VP Kamala Harris takes over. Now she could only one, run for one more term because she would have almost eight full years. However, if something happened in 2023, then she could not only finish Biden's time in office, but then also uh, run for her own two terms because she would serve for less than 10 years total. This is all hypothetical though, okay? But basically we look at the 22nd Amendment for two consecutive terms. The Taft-Hartley Act is basically geared at labor. And what ended up happening is because prices were going up and labor as well as their management were starting to demand higher wages and management refused because of the unions and the unions ended up going on strike. Um, we're talking about nearly 5,000 strikes going on during this time period. And so the congressmen ended up um, getting involved by creating the Taft-Hartley Act, and this was over the president's veto. And what they were geared to do was to try to curb the power of labor unions and also state that if you were in a work job or the workforce that was dealing with something that could endanger our national health or safety, then you could not go on strike. Um, Truman did not want to pass it, okay, um, but it ends up getting overridden and passed into law. And in the Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, um, what this basically was, was a check on the executive power claims and that the president couldn't seize private property because basically the president was going to force steel workers to go back to work instead of on strike. 
The other part that Truman dealt with was the civil rights, and um, he got started with it by desegregating the military and federal government with Executive Order 9981. So Truman's policy at home was known as the um, Fair Deal, and it's kind of designed like the New Deal from FDR. And there was a lot of social wel welfare programs. And there was actually a 21 point domestic program that included things like expanding social security, increasing minimum wage and um, providing for a housing act of 1949 that would do like urban city projects as well as public housing. Um, however, he was limited in being able to provide like a national health care insurance or even civil rights legislation. So then President Eisenhower is in office. And Eisenhower, if you recall, um, from military background, he really could have gone either Republican or Democrat, but goes Republican for his political affiliation. Um, but he was definitely more of a moderate Republican. Um, he did reduce the federal um, scope and size of power. He did balance budget or attempted to and had pro-business policies. But at the same time, remember, he's dealing with the second Red Scare and a lot of civil rights issues. So at home, we have this unprecedented prosperity um, to the point, and I had mentioned this already under Truman, some of that you know, economic growth continues here, where Americans represented 6% of the population, but we drove 75% of the world's automobiles, and we consumed half of the world's energy and produced almost half of the world's manufactured products. So the World War II rationing and this idea of save ended up allowing for this pent up consumerism as people wanted cars, they wanted homes, they wanted um, appliances, that type of idea. So the idea of suburban growth um, comes from William Levitt, and he successfully applied the techniques of mass production and your assembly line production to make affordable homes. And then when you add that with the GI Bill, which allowed veterans, you know, the low interest mortgage and moderate monthly payments, it made housing more affordable and therefore people began to move more to the suburbs. And with that, you then have the highway system, okay? And this um, Eisen, under Eisenhower, the highway system was in 1956, um, the government appropriated or gave $25 billion for a 10 year project to construct 40,000 miles of a, an interstate highway system. Now, with all of this going on, you have the baby boom, okay? And it, the baby boom is looking at um, basically 1940s, 1946 or so to 1964, you have about 76 million people that were born during that 20 year period or so. Why? Well, marriage rates are um, increasing. The marriage age is decreasing. So more people had children um, and women are going back into the home. So about the women's role, you know, it's this interesting time. After World War I, women got the right to vote. And you have the 1920s flapper movement with a lot of newfound freedom for young women um, and jobs that became available to them. But then with World War II, um, we then have women entering the workforce, taking over the job of the men. Think of Rosie the Riveter, right? Well, after World War II, despite the newness of working and the sense of purpose, women were told to go back into the home. And... Um, there was the encouragement between the marriage rates, the birth rates for women to return back to the traditional gender role that had been them as a homemaker. And this is reinforced through TV shows and movies as well. So then the overall idea of consumerism, people are even buying like new TV sets as well. In this PowerPoint here is a great video clip talking about the American suburban life, um, how, you know, between the new inventions of cars so people could travel more, people could drive from place to place. You're not beholden on public transportation. I don't have to walk anywhere, which would be symbolic of like your city living. Um, you have then Levittown developing, you know, your suburb life, the planned communities, that type of idea. Um, you then also end up getting shopping malls. 
Um, but part of, you know, even though there had been this consumer confidence and people moving into these suburbs, you still have some effects and some of them are less than desirable effects. Um, the idea of urban decay, that cities are not being updated and kept up as they should be, because people aren't living there anymore. You have the idea of white flight people moving to the suburbs, and then you have the idea of sundown towns. Sundown towns are basically looking at your segregation and the fact that Black people should not be in certain areas after the sun goes down for their own safety. So in the nifty 50s, if you will, you have corporate America, and this is where a lot of men were working white collar jobs. The difference between white collar and blue collar jobs, white collar jobs would be more in your office setting. You wore a white shirt, collared shirt and tie, right? Blue collar jobs were more symbolic of people that had to wear a uniform um, that were, you know, more your manual labor jobs. OK, so we see corporate America emerging and we see this idea of consumerism, buying with credit cards, shopping malls, strip malls, that type of thing, which then leads also to this idea of advertising. And we get brand names and franchising um, like Ford and Cheerios and Chef Boyardee and Carnation Milk, among others that really emerged during this time period. Again, I would encourage you to go through the slideshow because there are some great video clips shown in here as well. Now for TV ownership increases, there were only about 9% of homes that owned TVs in 1950. And by 1960, 87% of the homes owned at least one TV. So what's the impact? Corporate sponsorship on TV shows, sitcoms um, showing off the American family life. Uh, like the TV show, I Love Lucy with Lucille Ball. You also have movies um, that are going to be more epic with science fiction and Cold War themes like Rebel Without a Cause and The Day the Earth Stood Still. So with this in society, we see the juxtaposition between the conformist traditional conservative society and more the rebellious modernist idea. Very similarly to how in the 1920s, we saw more the traditional side of things, the way people wanted to always do what they had done, and then the more modern adaptation of it. So for the conservative um, side of things, people were more um, conformist, okay, with materialism, the baby boom, the idea of um, uh, gender roles in suburbia and being against drugs. Church membership jumped from 49% in 1950 to 69% in 1960. So it jumped 20% in just 10 years. Why? Conformity, American, you know, the so-called American dream, the American life, and also fear of communism. So the impact of this on politics is that we added in 1954, the phrase under God to our pledge of allegiance. And in 1956, we added the phrase in God we trust to our money. And so then the gentleman on the bottom left here is Billy Graham. And he was an evangelical um, leader who, you know, preached that boredom and so, uh, would lead to juvenile delinquency and rebellion leads to juvenile delinquency. And, um, you know, teenagers are going to be leading this movement and everything of that nature. So on the note of teenagers and rebellion, I mean, they're going to be attracted to the lifestyle of rock and roll, TV, movie stars, dancing. Um, there is what's known as the beat generation or beatniks, and they're the ones that re reject um, contemporary conformity and materialist lifestyle. And you begin to see a little bit of experimentation, but in the 1950s, we're still a little bit early for that hippie era. So the last part that I wanted to talk about here is going to be President Kennedy with his domestic and foreign policies. Keep in mind, President Kennedy, when he ran for election in 1960, he was a Democratic candidate. And what ends up happening is he runs against Vice President or former Vice President Richard Nixon for the Republican Party. And over a, you know, the series of months, um, people are worried about Kennedy. Why? Well, he was 43 years old. He was young. He was handsome, but he was a Roman Catholic. And people were worried that he would be torn between his allegiance to Rome, the Vatican, the Pope, and America, the White House, and our federal government. And so actually in Houston, Texas, he was giving a speech before um, a group of Protestant ministers, and he firmly rejected the belief 
that he would divide loyalties. He said, I am a Democratic candidate for the presidency who happens to also be a Catholic. And so it kind of settled any questions and doubts that there were from people. Now, Nixon and Kennedy did also have the first televised TV debates and um, Kennedy kind of swept to the floor with him because he appeared calm, cool, collected, whereas Nixon appeared tired and haggard and sweaty and just unsure of himself. So Kennedy gets elected and on inauguration day, it was interesting to see the idea of here's Eisenhower and he was the oldest president at the time. And then you have Kennedy, here's the youngest president at the time. So it said that the torch has been passed to a new generations of American, excuse me, new generation of Americans. <laughs> so Kennedy's idea was a new frontier program. And the new frontier program was to provide aid uh, for education, healthcare, urban renewal, civil rights, and to help develop Appalachia area. And basically he was able to do a lot of this except for the healthcare. Um, he did see, uh, you know, for the economy decreases with the steel industry, decreasing in prices for the steel industry, excuse me. Um, increase in the spending on defense and space exploration, an increase in minimum wage. Minimum wage back then at a dollar an hour would be about 665 today, but then also made fiscal and monetary adjustments as well to our economy to help keep us going. Fiscal is what the government does through tax and revenue, um, whereas the Federal Reserve is the one that controls like the money supply. Um, so during Kennedy's short time in office, you have the foreign policy, and a lot of it takes place because of uh, our relations with the Cold War and Cuba. In 1961, he forms the Peace Corps, and the Peace Corps is still active today, and it goes in to developing countries to provide aid for them. Not necessarily money, but more like education or other resources for them. The Alliance for Progress program was to help out Latin America with like land reform, economic development, that type of idea, trying to extend goodwill to Latin America. And then in 1962, he helps with the Trade Expansion Act and it reduces tariff rates with Europe to help open up some more trade. So the nuclear, uh, excuse me, his idea was on nuclear warfare was that we should have a flexible response. So keep in mind, um, Truman was containment, okay? Eisenhower is brinkmanship and um, Kennedy is going to be flexible response that we should use more of the conventional non-nuclear weapons and mobilize our military forces um, and increase the money spending on that. But then again, we would also use groups like the Green Beret um, in Africa and in Southeast Asia as well. So then um, the Cold War really heats up almost to the point of explosion with Kennedy over Cuba. It starts off in 1961 with the failed CIA um, invasion of the Bay of Pigs. So Kennedy inherited the Bay of Pigs plan from Eisenhower. And what had been going on behind the scenes, if you remember, I mentioned that Fidel Castro assumed power in Cuba in 1959. And some Cuban rebels were in the United States and the CIA trained them to land at the Bay of Pigs um, in order to then take over the country, cause an uprising, rising. However, the CIA backed Cubans got trapped on the beach and surrendered to Cuba and the US did not send any forces to rescue them. So as a result, Castro got more aid from the Soviet Union. And if you can tell from the um, cartoon, you have Kennedy with a Cuban cigar and it's blowing up in his face. So some more heightened tensions is when um, the Soviet Union builds the Berlin Wall around um, West Berlin. And it's about 103 miles long with a 28 mile stretch dividing specifically East and West Berlin. The United States was supposed to pull out our troops and we did not. And therefore the war, uh, the wall ended up being built and the wall lasts until about 1990 or so. So the Cuban Missile Crisis happens in October of 1962. And I would say this is the brink of going to war, okay? 
So Cold War tensions are running high and the US finds out that the Soviet Union had placed missile launch pads in Cuba and they were aimed at the United States. So JFK wanted to establish a naval blockade of Cuba, which is like the purple area that you see on the map, um, until the weapons were removed. And the US and the Soviet Union go back and forth and it's really tense and it's a matter of open communication lines. And finally, Nikita Khrushchev for the Soviets back down if the US promised to remove missiles from Turkey. They're like, we'll remove ours if you remove yours. And so we agreed to this. What we also ended up setting up as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis is if you've ever seen the stereotypical movie scene where there's like a red phone that connects Moscow to um, Washington DC, that is the direct communication line that we had established as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we over 100 nations do end up signing in 1963 a um, nuclear test ban treaty in order to end testing in the atmosphere. We also see in 1963 the assassination of JFK. So I would encourage you once again to go in and watch these video clips, okay? So JFK is in Dallas, Texas, and he is on parade in a convertible. And he is sitting in the back seat next to his wife, and he ends up getting hit at least two or three times. Um, the video clip on the left that you see that's labeled Zapruder film is a slow motion of the actual um, shooting of JFK. Zapruder had been a businessman who, uh, whose office was along the route for the motorcade, and he was videotaping it for you know posterity reasons and he realized he happened to catch the perfect like the assassination from a perfect angle so he ended up turning over um the film footage to the fbi and they allowed him to keep the original copy while they took you know additional copies of it and um if you watch the film just as a heads up uh you will see kennedy get shot and kind of like curl over and grab his neck and then in a moment later, you will end up seeing his head get shot at. Um, the other video clip is Walter Cronkite on air getting the notice that um, President Kenny not only had been shot, but then had been killed as well. So this really ends our discussion of um, looking at Kennedy looking at um, Eisenhower and Truman beforehand. Now, part of what else is coming at you is going to be then the civil rights movement, but we'll take a look at that at future date, okay? If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a good one.